are almost the same age. We're meeting in the middle. I'm not mistaken how nothing lasts. What a shame that is. Some things last. Brad Pitt takes an unusual journey living a life in reverse. I'm Ben Mankiewicz from Turner Classic Movies. And I'm Ben Lyons from E! Entertainment. Our first movie today is The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. Now it opens next week, so this is an early review. Based on a short story by F. Scott Fitzgerald, Brad Pitt stars as Benjamin Button, a man who's born under rather unusual circumstances. He begins his life as an elderly infant and gets physically younger as he ages. Left for dead on the doorstep of an old age home, he's taken in and cared for by Taraji P. Henson, who warmly plays Queenie, the woman Benjamin grows to consider his mother. Visiting her grandmother in the New Orleans estate is Daisy, a red-headed young girl who immediately befriends Benjamin and captures his heart. You know, you don't seem like an old person. Like my grandma. I'm not. Are you sick? Well, I heard Mama and Daisy whisper and they said I was going to die soon, but maybe not. Daisy, as an adult, is played by Kate Blanchett, who, no surprise, is tremendous, as always. Benjamin and Daisy spend most of their teen years and 20s apart. He works on a tugboat, goes off to war, and has a brief affair with Tilda Swinton, as Elizabeth Abbott, the aristocratic woman who is charmed by Benjamin's peculiar condition. You haven't been with many women, have you? Well, I'm not dressed. Oh, you look splendid, just as you are. Daisy pursues a career as a dancer, living in New York and Paris, and when the two destined lovers finally meet in the middle of their respective life journeys, that's when the film evolves into a romantic masterpiece. Finally caught up with the job. Wait. I want to remember us just as we are now. The characters that come in and out of Benjamin's life are distinct memorable and wonderfully conceived. If Forrest Gump was an ordinary man who lived an extraordinary life, then Benjamin Button is an extraordinary man who lives a rather ordinary life. And it's a credit to director David Fincher, the true star of the film, that he is able to find the beauty in the ordinary. His use of cutting edge special effects to age Brad Pitt and Blanchett will change the way movies are made. Films like this one don't come along so often, so be sure to see it. It's my favorite movie of 2008. This is a long movie. This is a movie at uh, plus two and a half hours. Did you find it dragged a little bit there in the middle? I, I really didn't. I found myself absorbed in the characters, and as much as I was watching their romance on screen, I was thinking about my own life and where I'm at in my life's journey on my timeline, a very sort of introspective experience. I thought in the middle of the movie, after they fight in New York and it's unclear when, whether they're going to end up together, that there were some solid chunks that I thought really slowed the process down. That said, it's not just that Brad Pitt starts off old and looks to be an 80-year-old man. It's that he has the height, while being an 80-year-old man, of a six- or seven-year-old boy up on stage with fully grown people. And he looks, he's four foot two. I mean, I sat there literally jaw-dropping, wondering, how did they do that? Yeah, Fincher is absolutely amazing. He's my choice for the director at this year at the Oscars, best director. I think he used motion capture yeah. technology, which is really groundbreaking. It's one of those films that every movie after this will be judged against this film. He uses those HD Viper cameras that he used in Zodiac to create the look and texture of the movie, which is so rich. Yeah, I love the Tilda Swinton segment. That little 20-minute block, my favorite part of the film. Did not love it as much as you. Still a terrific film, a quality movie. I definitely think people should see it. Our next film, Clint Eastwood's Gran Torino, which also stars Eastwood as Walt Kowalski, a Korean War vet, a recently widowed, retired Detroit auto worker, snarling and growling at his grown kids with whom he's never connected, at his grandkids who wear football jerseys and belly button rings to his wife's funeral. He's even surly to the priest. I'd really like to talk, Mr. Kowalski. Not in this lifetime, Sonny. Why? Do you have a problem with me, Mr. Kowalski? You don't want to know. No, I do. Well, I think you're an overeducated 27-year-old version who likes to hold the hands of old ladies who are superstitious and promises them eternity. Clint also scowls at his new neighbors, a Southeast Asian ethnic group called the Mongs. He's the old school guy on a block overhauled by white flight. And when a Mong teen tries to steal Walt's beloved 1972 Ford Gran Torino, his relationship with the family next door changes permanently, but not how Walt expects. My family is very traditional and would be very much upset if you don't let Tao repay. Kalia, if he doesn't want to do it, then, then let's just go. 
In an homage to Dirty Harry, Walt comes out with his shotgun and chases Hmong gang members off his lawn, inadvertently protecting the young boy next door. The result? Walt softens and befriends the kid. This is really the evolution of Harry Callahan, and it's hard not to see Harry in Walt. But in Gran Torino, we also see the development of Eastwood into the nuanced, textured actor he's become. It is not a perfect film, Ben, but I definitely think it's well worth seeing. Definitely not a perfect film. At times, I felt the audience was being spoon-fed certain ideas. I don't think the kids would show up wearing belly button rings and football jerseys. But every line is there for a reason. And Eastwood is really fantastic in the twilight of his career. It's been rumored that this is his last time on screen. So for that reason alone, you have to see it. On top of it, he's that good. I don't know if I could see any other older actor in this part. And in that scene, you mentioned Dirty Harry living through this character when he says, get off my lawn. Sure. That's a scene that's going to live with Eastwood forever. I mean, that's a great line in, in, a, in a pretty good movie. Well, I mentioned it. So I, I loved the kids with the belly button rings and the jerseys. I thought that was perfect. I thought what did not work was uh, some of the Hmong actors. They hired inexperienced actors uh, uh, to fill these parts. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't, but there were a couple of moments with the boy in some crucial scenes where it really seemed like we had one real professional, and, and I think the movie was hurt by that. Sure, I mean, his casting in Changeling kind of went through the same thing, where he had a lot of unknown actors, yeah. and some were able to deliver great performances, and you take the risk with an unknown actor, and sometimes it doesn't work out, and that definitely affected this movie. Well, I think you mentioned that maybe this will be Eastwood's uh, last time on screen. I think if it is, it's too bad, because we clearly see here that he's capable of continuing to play strong strong roles on screen. But if it is his last time, I agree with you, it's a sort of a perfect ending. Sure. Now, I want to be clear, as much as I might have had a little problem here and there with some of the actors or some of the lines, this is a cool movie, and I would have to say see it. Coming up next, Jim Carrey won't give no for an answer in Yes Man. And later, Will Smith stars in one of the most mysterious movies of the year, Seven Pounds. I don't want to keep lying to you. I do you want to take guitar lessons? I am part of Would you be the man for me? I guess so. Yes, I would like to learn Korean. What did he call me? <laughs> oh. Let's be honest, Jim Carrey's turn at Dramatic Fair has been hit or miss over the years. For every triumph, like Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind and Man on the Moon, there's been a misstep, like the Majestic and most recently the number 23. Now he's back in his comfort zone with Yes Man, a family comedy where he plays Carl Allen a bank employee who undergoes a life-changing transformation. After falling out of touch with his closest of friends and the world itself, Carl is coerced into going to a self-improvement seminar that instructs him to abolish using the word no in exchange for saying yes every single chance he can. We're gonna make a covenant, Carl. Do you want to make a covenant? Oh. The word is yes, Carl. Reese Darby from HBO's Flight of the Concords is very funny as Carl's boss. He invites Carl to Harry Potter and 300 themed costume parties that Carl, of course, has to say yes to attend. Chips, dips, and good people, just like you two. Ah, oh, thanks. Pace yourselves, it's gonna be a crazy night. Zoe Deschanel plays Allison, Carl's quirky love interest, and she's far too young to have any chemistry with the funny man, who is almost 20 years her senior. Contrived and silly to say the least, it's like a stale and dated liar liar. I say no to yes man. You can skip it. You mentioned it, Reese Darby. He's funny on Flight of the Concords. He's terrific here. He's really, really funny in this. Yeah, he steals every scene he's in. Yeah, and this is his first big movie. He hadn't done much before Flight of the Concords. I hope we'll be seeing a, a lot more of him. One scene, but a very good scene and an important scene from Terrence Stamp. Hard for Terrence Stamp to be bad. He's the motivational speaker. Nice day's work, too, for a talented actor to have some fun in something like this. What doesn't work is everything else in the movie. And uh, those, uh, the nice part by Reese Darby and the one scene by Terrence Stamp does not save it. We see glimpses of the Jim Carrey from the Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind from the Truman Show where we see him, in addition to the slapstick, do some real acting. But it, it's not enough and ultimately the relationship doesn't work. I'm with you. I think this movie needs to be skipped. I don't know why she plays opposite older guys all the time. Yeah. She played opposite Mark Wahlberg in The Happening and right. opposite Will Ferrell in Elf. I want to see her paired with somebody her own age because, yeah, here it doesn't work. Look, scotch tape around the face. We've seen it from Jim Carrey for, for the last 50 
15, 20 years. So enough already. This is nothing special at all. Coming up next, Will Smith is on a mission to change lives in seven pounds. And later, Matthew Broderick voices a mouse on a mission in the tale of Despero. Here I come! It is within my power to drastically change his circumstances. But I don't want to give that man a gift that he doesn't deserve. Tell me what's going on. You can't play with people's lives! Why is she under the impression your name is Ben? You better leave me alone. In Seven Pounds, Will Smith stars as an incredibly unrealistic character, a sympathetic IRS agent. Smith is Ben Thomas. He's an agent behaving mysteriously, finding people in deep debt to the government and offering to help. Among them, Rosario Dawson, Thank you. suffering from congenital heart failure. Uh, why do I get the feeling you're doing me a really big favor right now? Because I get the feeling that you really deserve it. The question is, why is Ben doing this? It's more than a question, really. It's the entire crux of the movie, which is told by director well. Gabriel Muccino in intriguing non-linear fashion. We know Will Smith is going to extraordinary lengths to help seven people. We know he's driven by something that happened to him. And just to add to the intrigue, we know he's asking for help himself from an old friend, Dan, played by Barry Pepper. You think I'm going to let you down now, don't you? I've known you my whole damn life! Okay? This, this, this is not something you do every day. Okay? This is, this is not easy for me. This is a very emotional film. I'm not I'm sure, sure some key plot plan. points will hold up as you talk while driving home from the theater, but I'm also not sure that matters much. It will affect you while you're in the theater, which is what matters. Will Smith is quite remarkable, giving a wonderfully emotive performance here. Rosario Dawson, very strong as one of the seven people he helps. One flaw, the other six are not nearly as well flushed out, and I think that does undermine the movie to an extent, but it is still worth seeing that. I'm always amazed at movie stars at the level of Will Smith, that you forget that he's Will Smith, and he becomes this IRS agent, and yeah. you instantly lose yourself in it. However, the film took so long to get going. The first two-thirds, or even three-quarters of it, is really overbearingly slow to the point when the, the plot comes together and there is a really cool twist at the end I really just didn't care at that point it was a moment where I thought hey reveal something to me like this has gone on a long time I need to have some little glimpse of what's going on You're right because he asks a lot of the audience without giving anything for their hard work in return right at the moment where I was getting frustrated I started to get some information and again I think it is powerful I think it really is an emotional movie uh, and ultimately uh, therefore I did like it and th that big twist at the end like I said if you go back and analyze it I'm not sure it holds up but I don't think it really matters all that much. It's powerful in the moment. You know, there's a cloud of secrecy surrounding this film, and that's a big reason why you haven't seen it nominated for anything. It didn't get the movie out there early and get people talking about it, partly because I think it's just kind of average. But Rosario Dawson is great and worthy of some type of recognition throughout this award show season. I don't think she's going to get it. And a side note quick as we wrap, the music in this movie was just an afterthought, completely distracting and, and awful. I'm so, going to say rent it. Rent it, okay. Yeah. Next up is Nothing But The Truth, starring Kate Beckinsale as Rachel Armstrong a reporter at a major Washington, D.C. newspaper. I know, I know. After publishing an explosive story outing the identity of an undercover CIA agent who's played by Vera Farmiga, the government pressures Rachel to reveal her source. I can't tell you anything. You know what? When you go before the grand jury, you will have to speak. You are an unpatriotic little okay. who's going to walk right off the plank in the bowels of hell. Do you know that? Placed at the eye of a wonderfully powerful ethical storm of right and wrong, Armstrong doesn't back down from the government's insistent threats and persistent prosecutor, played by Matt Dillon, as he stops at nothing in his attempts to make her crack. And if you want to waltz into a courtroom in a martyr's cloak, trust me, you're going to see a wave of self-righteous indignation that you can't even begin to imagine. Director Rod Laurie used to be one of us, a film critic. He has since stepped away from critiquing movies in exchange for actually making them. And this effort is his best work so far. The movie does have some problems, though, such as the film's almost cringe-inducing big twist in Act 3. Now, that said, it's Kate Beckinsale, who is fantastic, and she's able to hold the strong premise long enough to keep my interest in a politically charged thriller that I think you should see. Yeah, you know, this really takes the Valerie Plame case and the Judith Miller case, the New York Times writer. Uh, she obviously spent time in, uh, behind bars, locked up for not revealing her sources, puts them together in one story, I think, very effectively. This 
was on its way to being one of my favorite movies of the year, and I'm a big Rod Lurie fan. I thought the performances were great, particularly Vera Farmiga. And then that twist, that cringe-inducing twist, is really just, it's not really even act three. It's the last nine minutes. It was terrible. It was a horrible thing they've done. I think still a movie worth seeing. Yeah, I don't think it ruins the movie. No, I don't. But it definitely takes the movie down a couple notches. And it is a, a really interesting premise that they have set up here. I think David Schwimmer, you're talking about good performances. He's really good as her husband. Matt Dillon is a persistent, and he's very powerful in his scenes with Kate Beckinsale. And you know who's a great actor who we overlook? Uh, Alan Alda. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you, you know. Take him for granted, because he's Alan Alda. Granted. Don't overlook him. You but take shows him up about an hour into the movie yeah. and really kicks it into a second gear. If you're able to sort of step back, let an hour go by, that's when I thought, no, you know what, I really like that first part. And I'm going to let those last nine minutes go and still say see you. Well, coming up, Matthew Broderick is a misfit mouse in the tale of Desperate. Are you a rat? No. A mouse? I am a gentleman. Voila. Mm. Oh, your highness. A cute, lovable, animated rat who loves food, then he falls into the soup and sets off a mad chase to catch him. Sound familiar? But alas, this is not Ratatouille, but The Tale of Despero, a film adaptation of a popular 2004 children's book. Here, the mouse and rat become pals. Try to identify these high-profile voices. Tell me that story about the princess. Well, she was... Was she angry? No. No, not at all. Her heart was full of longing. What's longing? That's Matthew Broderick as Despero and, and Dustin Hoffman as the rat, but this story oh. and script really failed oh. to live up to an all-star cast of voices. Who are you? I'm here to help you. By getting me caught with a real rat in my bunk? I don't think so. That was Tracy Ullman as the princess's servant. Also, Emma Watson, Frank Langella, Kevin Klein, and Sigourney Weaver, among others, all lend their voices to a meandering story that looks pretty, but plays dead on screen. Totally without vibrance, lacking the life-affirming celebration we've come to expect from top-notch animated features. At one point at my screening, after a joke died, a young child loudly declared, that's not funny. He nailed it. Skip it. You know, this is a film that has an all-star cast of, like you said, Franklin Joe and William H. Macy and Christopher Lord. I'd love to see all those people in a live-action movie. I don't yeah. want to see them in an animated movie, especially one that is, is just plain thievery. You mentioned Ratatouille, but also Shrek in the world of medieval knights and princesses. And it just tries to take a little bit from some of the things we've seen over the last few years that have worked to make this work. And it's just desperate, and it doesn't work. It's like Ratatouille meets Upstairs Downstairs to go sort of <laughs> cross-generational. But it didn't work, really, on, on any level, And I there's thought. two types of animation for me nowadays. There's sort of the cartoony animation of Kung Fu Panda, and then there's the ultra-realistic Wally type animation, and that's what this is trying to be, and it's just definitely a notch or two below Pixar and the amazing things they're able to do over there. I say skip it. I agree. Want to know what you can't miss this weekend? Stay tuned for my three to six. I'm really here. Closed captioning for At The Movies is sponsored by... Kids of all ages love hugging animals from Build-A-Bear Workshop. This holiday, we're hugging you back even more. With more bears than ever starting at $10. Perfect for everyone on your holiday gift list. Build-A-Bear Workshop, where best gifts are made. Hotel provided by Park Hyatt Chicago. Chicago's award-winning hotel and luxury dining experience. Located in the heart of Chicago's magnificent mile on Water Tower Square. All right, time to recap the movies on this week's show. We both say you should see The Curious Case of Benjamin Button when it opens next week. You should also see Clint Eastwood in Gran Torino. We agree you can skip Yes Man, and I say you should rent seven pounds. Ben says you should see it. We both say you should see nothing but the truth, and we agree that you can skip The Tale of Desperate. Ben just told you about the movies we reviewed this week, but out of all the films and theaters right now, here are three you have to see. I'll start with two movies we reviewed today. First, Seven Pounds. Will Smith really strong here, and I think you ought to see it before friends reveal the story's secret, but it's not really about the twist, it's about getting there. At number two, Clint Eastwood's Grand Torino. If we never see Eastwood again on screen, he went out as a performer at the top of his game. His character may be a retired auto worker named Walt Kowalski, but that sure seemed like Dirty Harry Callahan at 78. And at number one, we had an early review last week. Mickey Rourke in Darren Aronofsky's The Wrestler. Put simply, it's the best movie I've seen this year. That's it for now. Remember, we're always online on AtTheMoviesTV.com. And we'll leave you with a look at movies coming up on next week's show. And until then, as always, 
We'll be at the movies. A dog doesn't care if you're rich or poor. Give him your heart, and I'll give you his. Hitler's Germany has seen its last sunrise. The perfect gift just got even better. For a limited time, buy a $25 IHOP gift card and get $5 off a future visit. IHOP. Come hungry, leave happy. Immugo helps support a healthy immune system and boost energy. Twist off cap and drink. Hollywood's secret for immune support and energy. Immugo, the official immune support product of the Hollywood Movie Awards. The rhinovirus, a leading cause of the common cold. Why just cover up the symptoms of your cold when you can get over your cold faster with Zycam. In my kitchen, I want only the best in taste. Eggland's best. I love Eggland's best because of all the great nutrition. That's why they're the only eggs I give to my son, the chef. Eggland's best. The better egg.